Well, it turns out that because experts organize their knowledge differently, this can lead to what's called the expert blind spot. Essentially, it is very difficult for experts to remember what it was like to be a novice. Therefore, when they have to teach other people their field, they teach it at an expert level, forgetting that no, there was a whole process they had to go through to earn that expertise. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now as you may know I have a new book out called 10 Things Schools Get Wrong and How We Can Get Them Right. So what I've decided to do is for the next 10 videos I've selected papers that align with different chapters of that book. So for this week I want to just start with chapter 1 which is called Expertise, the Problem with Experience. And the article I've selected this week that aligns with that chapter is called Expert Blind Spot Among Pre-Service Teachers by Nathan and Petrosino. To understand this paper, we have to wrap our head around the idea of expertise. Now there are two defining characteristics that make an expert. First, experts have more knowledge than average individuals about a particular field. And second, they organize that information differently than typical individuals. So not only do they have more information, but they organize it, conceptualize it, think about it differently. Now why might this matter? Well, it turns out that because experts organize their knowledge differently, this can lead to what's called the expert blind spot. Essentially, it is very difficult for experts to remember what it was like to be a novice. Therefore, when they have to teach other people their field, they teach it at an expert level, forgetting that no, there was a whole process they had to go through to earn that expertise. So you can imagine this can be a huge problem in, in education. In fact, we see it quite a bit. So let's just take the field of English. When we take a look at high school English teachers who are experts at their field but have no real training in teaching and pedagogy, what we find is they typically select 72% of their reading material from what's called canonical text. So these are texts that are historically deemed important. And when they teach these texts, they do so from a highly text-centered analytical angle. Focus on structure, focus on content. On the other hand, when we look at teachers that have high expertise in English, but who have also studied teaching and pedagogy, what we find is they select only 22% of their books from canonical texts. The rest are from what are called adolescent texts, thought to be more relevant to teenagers. And when they teach these texts, they do so from a student-centered point of view, where they focus more on how does this information, these ideas connect to these students and their personal lives. And as you can imagine, when we compare the students from these two different classes, the kids who work with the pure experts typically move significantly slower than the kids who work with experts who also have teaching and pedagogical knowledge. So we have this expert blind spot where too much knowledge about a field might make it difficult for you to teach that field. Now enter this paper. What these researchers wanted to see is could they find this expert blind spot amongst math teachers as well? So what they did is they got two different groups of high school teachers. One were math experts who hadn't yet studied teaching and pedagogy. The others were simply good at math. They had studied it in high school and college, but they had explicitly studied teaching and pedagogy. And they wanted to see what these two different groups of teachers approach teaching differently. Now to understand the results, we gotta kinda of start at the end first and work our way back. So when it comes to teaching algebra, there are kind of two routes you can take. The first is linguistic. So these are those simple word problems. For instance, basketballs cost a certain price. If I buy four basketballs, how much total money do I have to spend? Now the other way to approach algebra is symbolic. Using that same question, we can just write it out as x times four equals what? Now here's the important bit. When novice learners are presented with these two different types of questions, linguistic or symbolic, they show 20 to 30% better performance on the linguistic problems than the symbolic problems. Now, why might this be? Well, it turns out learning in pretty much every field always moves from concrete to abstract. Show me a bunch of specific examples that I can then weave together to pull out more abstract principles or concepts. So new learning moves from concrete to abstract. As you can probably guess though, once you hit expertise, all thinking reverses. Experts almost always start with the abstract and move backwards to apply that to different concrete situations. That's the joy of expertise. You have so much knowledge up here that you can reorganize it and think only in the abstract without having to worry about the specifics. So keep that in mind, this idea that novice algebra learners do better on linguistic problems than symbolic problems because they're still building up that knowledge. Now let's go back to our teachers. These researchers presented these two different types of problems, verbal versus symbolic, to the two different groups of teachers and asked them to rate which do you believe would be more difficult for students and how should you build your lesson. And what did they find? 
teachers with high math expertise but no teaching or pedagogy knowledge were far more likely to rank the symbolic questions as being easier than the verbal questions for novice learners, and they were two times more likely to use symbolic equations to teach algebra to new students. And as you can extrapolate, the kids who learned with the expert math teachers and were presented with symbolic equations before everything else performed significantly worse and moved much slower in their math learning than students who worked with the teachers who understood pedagogy and teaching. Now let's draw this back to us. What does this mean for schools and for education? Well, there are two things I want to hit. First, this demonstrates that expertise in a particular domain is very different than expertise in teaching and pedagogy. The ability to teach is a very unique, specific thing that one can learn to master. Too often we talk about teaching like it's kind of a fallback, like it's something anyone can do. So long as you know something, you can teach something. And here we see, no, no, no. The ability to teach is a standalone skill. And if you wanna be an effective teacher, developing an expertise in pedagogy and teaching is very important. And the second thing that kind of comes off of this then is teacher preparation and training. There are a lot of programs now in the world that are trying to fast track experts into teaching, to try and lure experts from different fields into the classroom to teach. And in order to achieve this, most of these programs forego explicit training in teaching and pedagogy. They essentially say, if you're an expert, come over here and teach our kids. As we're starting to learn, those programs might not be great. Due to the expert blind spot, a lot of these experts will come in and start teaching kids at a level that makes sense to them as experts, but that is very different than the process, the progress kids have to go through in order to earn that expertise. And I guarantee we've seen this before. Think back to when you were at university. I'm sure you had a class or two with some internationally renowned practitioner in whatever field you studied. And I'm equally sure that it was probably a very horrible class. Why? Because there is absolutely no truth to the adage that he who can does, he who cannot teaches. He who can might be able to do, but the ability to teach, to walk novices through that process is a very different skill set, and that's where teachers and teacher expertise comes to the fore. And here's where it aligns now to the first chapter of our book. So in this chapter, we take a deeper look at what does it mean to be an expert, how do we develop it, and what does teaching expertise mean in the wider context of academic research and scientific literature. So a lot of cool ideas here, a lot more to dig into. I hope you're all well, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye, y'all.